right? Hey, we're going to wrap up our series still more, so we're going to be in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. If you guys want to turn there with me, that would be awesome. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one fairly close to you under the seat rack in front of you, and if uh, neither of those options seem conducive, you can just read it on the big screen, and that will work just as well. Let me pray just one more time, and then we will dig in. Jesus, thank you for a new day. God, we just um, are so excited that we get to be yours and that your life um, was given to us in exchange for our sin and our sorrow and our death. And we pray that we would uh, live in that full reality, understanding who we truly have been made now that we are found in Christ, that we would uh, understand the extent of our riches, Lord God, that we would not live in poverty, but we would live in the abounding generosity of Jesus Christ and his love and his spirit. We would utilize your gifts and recognize them and celebrate them. And one of your greatest gifts to us, Lord God, is your word. I pray that we'd be a church who um, recognizes that, a church who engages in that, a church who um, submits to that and allows your word to teach and to grow and to educate us. And so we pray that that would occur today. Lord, please use me as a teacher. Please um, protect me from, from anything that would be false teaching or uh, incorrect slip of the mouth. And I just pray that your spirit would use my meager, um, incomplete, uh, imperfect offering, Lord God, and you'd be glorified. I pray for Anthem as they receive your word, Lord God, that they would um, use discernment through their spirit, your spirit in them, Lord God, and that we could just learn and grow for your glory. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Cool. Well, it feels like a big day, at least for uh, staff members. So we've, we just launched, like Sean said, that, that AM service downtown. I just got word there's 199 people there this morning, which is pretty sweet, like first morning. Yeah, so we're pretty excited. And obviously, um, what we don't want is just everybody from here to go down there and then for everybody down there to come up here. And we can just count you guys three times because uh, that, would, that would create a lot of CO2 if you guys are driving back and forth. That's our main concern, really. Um, but uh, our prayer is that we will really reach the neighborhood and the community and people that don't know Jesus will come to know Jesus uh, through our efforts downtown. And we, that's, that's just a pretty cool opportunity. And so we're pretty thrilled for that to happen. So first, let's, no, let's start that over. Second Thessalonians chapter three, let's read through it and then we'll, we'll break it down. <clears throat> Excuse me. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is, as it is with you. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all men have faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and that you will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. But we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge. But we worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have the authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busy bodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through the Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and that they eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey the word, our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Cool. So let's jump up to the beginning. That first paragraph um, is pretty fun before we get into some of the more gnarly stuff, but uh, we'll get there when we get there. So Paul says, finally, brethren, like he's wrapping things up. This is a conclusion. You can be excited. We're almost finished. We're going to make it today. He says, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and that it may be glorified. I think that's so cool that um, we recognize over and over again, prayer is such a huge hallmark in the life of Paul. Paul is always telling people he's praying for them, and Paul is always asking people to pray for him and the ministry that God has given him. And it's so cool that we see um, God uh, chooses to uh, unleash his power through our prayers. 
that he isn't uh, necessarily bound by our prayers, but he has chosen to unleash his power and his will unfolding in our world through our prayers. He has asked us to engage in that way. Paul recognizes that there is power when the saints pray, and so he is always asking people to pray for him just as he, in turn, is praying for them. And here is the prayer, that the word of the Lord, that the gospel message may run swiftly and that it may be glorified. And I think that's a really cool picture of people hearing and receiving the message. So Paul's prayer, his purpose in life, his number one passion is that this gospel message of Jesus may run swiftly in the world. Like Paul is all about propagating, spreading this gospel message of Jesus Christ. And he uses this word picture that it may run swiftly. He's saying, in essence, like, pray that nothing hinders this gospel, that no personal sin will inhibit my effectiveness to preach. Pray that no opposition will thwart the gospel message that is spreading across Asia, but pray that it will run swiftly, that it will go and be spread, and likewise, that it may be glorified. That we're not just preaching till we're blue in the face. We're not just yelling into the wind. We're preaching to people. We care for souls. And that this gospel message is glorified when it is received by persons who place their faith in Jesus Christ. And so we see that there's this transmission and a reception of the gospel. And that is what Paul is worried about. And that nothing has changed. Uh, we can look way back in history till Paul. And we can fast forward till today in the present. It ought to be our number one aim in this life as servants of Christ, that the gospel message of Jesus may run swiftly in Kootenai County, and that it may be glorified as many people walk from darkness into light as they receive this gospel message of Jesus Christ. Like, what a noble calling, what an awesome passion, what a worthy thing to pour out our lives uh, in this end. And that's exactly what Paul, uh, he's been bit by the bug, he gets it, and he's praying that the Thessalonians will catch this passion as well, because he says, just as it is with you. And that's cool. Like Paul throughout this whole um, series of these two epistles has been um, so um, constructive with these people. Like they have deep theological issues. Like they think they've missed the return of Christ. And, and obviously that, that's hard to jive with good theology. And so Paul's dealing with people who are misbehaving. He's dealing with the church uh, who is kind of misunderstanding teaching. And yet in the midst of it, he's very, very encouraging to these people. This is Paul the Apostle, not just your average ordinary Christian. He planted this church, and here he is saying, man, I pray that the gospel will spread with my ministry at least as much as your ministry. Like Paul's saying the Thessalonians are outshining Paul in this particular area, and what high praise Paul is giving these believers, and that's pretty awesome. And again and again, I hope that we are a church uh, that we're quick to congratulate people, or we're quick to encourage people. We're even more quick to do that than we are to challenge and to rebuke and to tell people off, right? Because that's what this world is all about. And so we see Paul standing in opposition to the culture and saying, let's celebrate the good within you before we work on your minor flaws. And so that's exactly what he's doing as this chapter plays out. Verse 2, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. So Paul, as usual, is facing stiff opposition. We can read uh, in Acts that when Paul planted this church in the, this little town called Thessalonica, that he was ran out of town. Like his physical uh, well-being was put in jeopardy so that they had to escape and they went to this neighboring town of Berea, and their safety was threatened there too, and so they had to go to a totally different province. And so Paul is like not unaccustomed to this. Paul gets opposition. He's received the flogging and the beatings. He's endured the false imprisonments. He's, he's gone through the ringer for this gospel message, and he's familiar with opposition, and yet he's praying that it won't overcome the gospel. And it's pretty interesting that in Paul's life or basically anywhere in the Bible, you, when you see the gospel of Jesus spreading and catching on like wildfire, uh, to almost to the same extent, you also see opposition rising against it. And it's clear that there's just opposition to the gospel of Christ. What Paul is wanting to point out here is that it's inevitable, almost. And it leaves this weird little gap that I'd love to challenge you with. I wish we could explore this more, but if a person as a believer or a church as a body of believers isn't experiencing opposition, it makes me wonder how effective they are against the enemy. If you're not even worthy of being uh, receiving opposition, then what's going on with you? And so that's not what Paul's saying here. Paul's saying is we're experiencing severe opposition, just as we know the Thessalonians are experiencing opposition. But he goes on, verse 3. The Lord is faithful, but the Lord is faithful, and he will establish you, and he will guard you from the evil one. First and foremost, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you align with him. 
Suddenly, Christ's enemies become your enemies. Suddenly, this evil one, Satan, and his demonic angels, they're against you. Their, their case is sp- clearly spelled out. They want to steal from you. They want to destroy you. They want to kill you. And so, we very clearly have spiritual enemies as a body of Christ and as believers. Without the power of Christ, we would be helpless and hopeless against the enemy. And it's so cool that Paul's pointing out that our struggle, as he spells out very clearly in Ephesians 6, our struggle isn't against other humans. It's against spiritual forces of evil. And so, to stand up against that, we need to recognize that the power and the victory come from our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Paul here says, the Lord is faithful. It is the Lord who will establish you. It is the Lord who will guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and that you will do the things that we command you. I uh, like to write in my Bible, and on this paragraph, I just wrote, rest and rely. I think that's so cool that all of this can be summed up in resting in the Lord and relying on His power and His victory. Paul isn't saying, oh man, you guys are awesome, you, are just, uh, you have a higher morality than other people, you're just more spiritual, you're more deserving of salvation, you sin less. None of that applies to them or to any other group of human beings. What Paul is saying is, Through the grace and through the powerful working of our Lord, you are saved, and you can stand in his victory, and you can have victory over the evil one as you spread the gospel message. And so all of it is contingent upon our faithful Lord and his work through us as we submit to him. So Paul has confidence not in the Thessalonians that they're going to do all this, but he has confidence in the Lord that the Lord will bring this to fruition through the obedience of this church. And so as Paul kind of wraps up this uh, nice, encouraging segment before we get into some stuff, he kind of wraps it up in verse 5. This is like the bow on the package. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Jesus Christ. I think that's so cool. Like we just sang about that love of God, right? When we were still sinners, when we were still enemies, God loved us enough to save us. We did nothing to earn this. It is absolutely unmerited, undeserved love that God lavishly poured out through the death of his son. And that's that agape love Paul is talking about, this perfect, unconditional love. It's not some uh, capricious, emotional response to affection. No, this is a choice of will that God decided, regardless of us, no matter how we received or rejected his love, God decided to unconditionally love us. And so that is what Paul is talking about. And he says, and may your hearts be directed into the patience of Jesus Christ. I hope that you guys read through the Bible. I hope that you guys do so as individuals, recognizing you can engage God's word and that his spirit will make it come alive for you. And uh, in doing so, I often read through the New Testament. And if you ever read through the New Testament, are you just ever boggled by the patience and endurance of Jesus? Like just knowing you are alive so that you can suffer an excruciating physical and spiritual death is just one thing. Like that stinks. But just reading through his interactions with the people and the Pharisees and the apostles and disciples or the disciples, uh, that guy had patience, right? Most of the time, people were following him for the wrong reasons. Most of the time when he spoke, they either just totally rejected it or they didn't understand it or they manipulated it. And uh, he's just continually arguing with people or straightening out the disciples who generally never seem to get it. And the more I read about our Savior, the more I recognize the patience that he exhibits throughout his life. And so for Paul to notice this and to say, now may you be directed into this unconditional love. May your heart be pushed towards this patience of Jesus Christ so that they may be made manifest within you. That's a pretty cool prayer to pray for people. Pretty cool petition to ask God for those two qualities in your life. And furthermore, we need to recognize that that's the foundation before we get into some pretty hard teaching about discipline, is that we need to do all of this. We need to look through the lens of this patience and patient endurance and this unconditional love before we get into holding people accountable, before we get into conflict resolution within the church. Now, verse 6. But we command you, brethren... Paul, again and again, uses odd terms. Sometimes they're like sporting terms when he likens our salvation to the Olympics or running a race. Oftentimes, Paul draws from military terms, and that's what he's doing here. This is a military command, meaning it's coming from a superior officer to a subordinate, meaning you don't really have a choice. This isn't uh, coming with some wiggle room so you can interpret what he really means. This is ironclad, like chiseled in stone, coming from your superior officer. You need to sit straight. You need to listen well to this command. 
And it's interesting that he uses a military term because he used a military term in his last epistle in 1 Thessalonians 5.14. He says, some of you are acting uh, unruly, meaning literally some of you are misbehaving your orders. You're not marching in step with the rest of the soldiers here. You're doing your own thing. We all have a cause and a purpose, and we're working towards a goal, and some of you are thwarting that by your misbehavior, by intentionally not obeying your commands. And so when Paul throws in this command word again, it's interesting that he's tying that back to this poor behavior that we found in this first epistle. I command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like he, This is the stamp. This is the weight he's applying. This isn't Paul and a human opinion. Like This is the teaching of an apostle with the full weight of the Lord Jesus Christ behind it. And this is that command, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition he received from us. Wow. That seems a little bit counter, counter biblical almost, right? Like, aren't we supposed to love and forgive and have grace and get along? And isn't that how we show the world that we are his disciples if we love one another? So how does it jive that we need to withdraw in certain instances from certain believers? And thankfully, Paul's going to unpack that a bit. That word withdraw, um, think of it as like a spiritual restraining order. The word literally means to abstain from, to reflexively withdraw away from, like you're shirking back when you see these people. Like it's, it's some pretty strong language. Not too often do you hear people say, keep your distance from certain members of your church, right? And so for Paul to say that, for it to be in our Bible is a little bit shocking nowadays. That too often us American believers, we love to think of ourselves as just totally insular. I'm a believer, my relationship with Jesus doesn't affect the church or your relationship with Jesus, and neither should your relationship affect mine. And that has no grounding in Scripture. Throughout Scripture, instead of a bunch of individuals that are just on a parallel track, what we do see is that we're members of a body, that we're connected to each other in very integral ways. And Paul uses that body analogy quite often. And so what we need to recognize is throughout the Old Testament with God's people, throughout the New Testament with the church, that we are an interconnected community of faith. If you are misbehaving intentionally, if you are continuing in unrepentant sin, obviously it's going to affect your life, but more than that, it will affect your church. And there's, there's weight with our relationships that we affect one another according to how we are obeying and pursuing Jesus Christ. And most often, that really chafes modern believers in the U.S. Because we love to be our own little island, and our salvation is our own thing, and we can talk about it if we want to, but how dare someone call us out if we're misbehaving, right? You have no right to do that. How dare you? Don't judge me. How often have you heard that thrown around? Man, it's like one of the, the favorite sayings of our culture today. And so it's very interesting for Paul to actually say, no, no, you have, you have every right. In fact, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ. If there is a believer in your church who continues to willingly sin, don't have anything to do with that person. Have a restraining order against that person spiritually. Like, like do not engage, do not invest relationally into that because there is significance there. That will drag you down. That will affect the church and that's totally countercultural, and that's pretty interesting. It reminded me uh, of maybe one of the most often misquoted passages that I hear, and that's Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 7, right? He says this, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Obviously, a hyperbole, we can get it. Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your own eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye, you hypocrites. And how often is that thrown around like, you worry about the plank in your own eye and let me deal with my own junk. And it's really interesting that Jesus recognizes that hypocrisy ought not exist. Like, I think basically, fundamentally, we can all like assent to that teaching, right? It makes sense. We need to focus on ourselves, on our own purity of heart, on our own obedience to Christ before we go around trying to discipline other people. That only makes perfect sense. But the interesting thing is our culture, oftentimes the church, never, ever reads that final verse in, in verse 5. You hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Like, even though we are supposed to deal with our own stuff first, even Jesus here is commanding us, is giving us the authority to help one another out, to hold one another accountable. If we see flaws in the faith or in the actions of a fellow believer, like in love and in relationship, we need to call them out. 
And this is a really interesting thing that is not often talked about. It's most often ignored in churches today. And so, a uh, pretty cool passage for us to talk about. So he goes on, um, talking about people who walk disorderly, not according to the tradition that they received from us. Well, what does that mean? He unpacks that in verse 7. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge. That eat anyone's bread is this Jewish idiom of saying, like, earn your keep. Like, we didn't utilize other people's resources. We weren't freeloaders. We weren't deadbeat pastors. Like, we set a good example of how to work and how to work hard and how to be faithful among you. Going on, he says, but we worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to you. Paul's saying we did the exact opposite of that, right? Like instead of just investing into the church wholly, we chose to be bivocational. We were church planters by day, and then during our time off, we made tents, and we worked hard with our hands, and we earned our living so that you could never accuse us of doing it for the money, so that you could never accuse us of being deadbeat, so you could never accuse us of setting a really low bar when it comes to working hard in this world. And so from the get-go, somehow Paul understood that this was probably going to be an issue with this church in Thessalonica, and immediately upon planting this church, Paul was setting really good examples and making really clear lines between like being just as deadbeat and being a really hard-working pastor, and that's exactly what Paul chose to do. And he goes on in verse 9, not because we do not have the authority. Paul's saying it is good to support pastors. It is good to support missionaries. It's talked about in the Old Testament. Jesus mentions it in Luke chapter 10, that it's an obligation. It's talked about in 1 Timothy chapter 5. It's a good thing to support people full-time for the gospel. And just as a side note, I'm supported full-time for the gospel. Thank you very much. So just had to just throw that out there. Um, but it's an awesome thing for us to be able to do that, to be freed full-time to serve the church so that you can be uh, employed and, and equipped to go and spread this gospel message. So Paul's not saying that pastors and missionaries receiving support is bad. That's not at all what he's saying. He says, uh, not because we do not have the authority, but we worked hard to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. Four, verse 10, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Wow. So we're supposed to stay away from someone, and now we're supposed to withhold benevolence. We're supposed to stop generosity towards people who won't work. That's those are some pretty strong language. Like this is kind of the worst message ever to preach at the beginning of the holiday season, right? Like awesome. Don't give gifts, guys. Keep it. Don't help anybody. Um, let's unpack this. Let's try to figure out who Paul is and who Paul isn't talking about. Number one, Paul was wise enough in his words to say this, if anyone will not work. What Paul says there in the original language is if anyone is unwilling to work. There are people who cannot work. There are circumstances when people cannot find work. That is not what Paul is talking about here. Who Paul is calling out is anyone who has the ability to work and yet is choosing to not work, that's where the issue lies. And furthermore, we should also point out that Paul is talking to the church. Paul is talking to people who self-profess to have their faith placed in Jesus Christ. We're not talking about the people outside of the walls of the church. We're not talking about people outside of the context of faith in Jesus. We're talking about the church here. And if there are people inside the church who can work, but who just uh, again and again abuse the church and rely on them for support or for any number of things, those people are misbehaving. They need to earn their keep. They need to start working and to start working hard like the rest of us. And so uh, Paul is drawing some really clear lines here with who we can and who we cannot apply these uh, circumstances to. And so again, we're talking about people inside the church who can but are choosing not to work. We are not talking about people who cannot work. We are not talking about anybody outside of the church. And again, always going back to promoting you guys digging into God's word for yourself. Um, my devotions this week are taking me through a, kind of the end of Jesus' ministry on earth because I'm going through the chronological Bible, which I highly suggest. Um, and so I got to Matthew 25, and taken out of context, at the end of Matthew 25, there's this um, scene of judgment where Jesus comes back and he judges the people, it says, as if a shepherd judges and separates sheep from goats. Sheep are good, goats are bad. I don't know why, go read your Bible. 
And so um, their credentials between getting into heaven, being a sheep, and going into hell, being a goat, is what we did or did not do for people in need. I thought that was very, very interesting. Taken totally out of context, it says nothing about faith. It says nothing about salvation. It has everything to do with how we responded when we saw persons in need. And Jesus boils it all down at the end to this. Whatever you did or did not do to the least of these, you did or did not do unto me. Like This is personal with Jesus Christ, how we do or do not respond when we see people in need. And so what this message isn't, this isn't a message of saying, just be a bunch of cheapskates who never help people. That's not at all the heart of the gospel. This is just applying to believers. And so that Matthew 25 verse was really interesting because I was thinking this through. Like, how, how does generosity, um, carrying significant weight in my eternal destiny, how does that jive with Second Thessalonians and withholding good from church members who are misbehaving? I'm mulling all this over in my mind. I break for lunch. Remember, it's like this miserable week in North Idaho. Woohoo! It's been a fun fall so far. Uh, and I go to the store on an errand, and there's this woman who is holding a sign wearing not enough clothing and just like violently shivering, and the sign says, uh, anything helps. And I was like, oh, wow, like talk about an opportunity for generosity. So I spend some time in the store like praying and engaging God, like should I help? How can I help? What, what is the correct response to this particular need? And just trying to discern through this. And I... Um, felt like I heard from the Lord. I felt like I knew how to respond in this particular instance with this particular woman and, and thought it was really cool, like almost like a test, right? Like if I'm going to be preaching on generosity to you guys and I withhold generosity or don't at least engage in it with the Lord, like what a hypocrite I am. And so it was cool for me to like deal with Jesus' words in Matthew 7 before I presented them to you guys. And so it ended up being like this really awesome opportunity for me to um, park right beside her and go out and to read her these verses and tell her she needs to get a job or quit begging and leave. And she cried a little. And it was just this awesome time we had. And um, praise God, right? Um, no, not at all. But I, I did end up helping this woman. And, um, and it was just cool to recognize, like, this isn't, again, I can't emphasize this enough. This isn't an excuse for you to um, be a miser. This is instead... Um, talking about a very specific instance in churches when church members behave poorly. And so Paul shifts gears now uh, towards something that we all love, which, which is work. And Paul says, to combat that, I worked hard. Man, I worked long hours, day or night, rain or shine. I worked so that I wouldn't be a, a drag on you guys or your income. And so this is the example. This is the tradition that he handed down to us, that he exhibited. Verse 10 uh, says, for when we were with you, we commanded this. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some among you who walk in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busy bodies. And so here's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with church members who are dealing with a few different issues. Number one, they just legitimately, incorrectly thought Jesus was coming back. So they quit their jobs. They were ready for him, right? But day after day, week after week, months turn into months, and Jesus isn't coming back, and they're just starting to really love this life of like this welfare state, right? They're relying on the church for income, for food, for housing, and they don't have to work, and things are great for them. And Paul's saying, guys, grow up, mature, get a job, supply for your family, quit being a burden on the church. They need to be generous with other people and not with you who are capable of working. Another thing that Paul was battling with was this Greek thought process. He's uh, in Greek territory, right? And up to a third or maybe more than a third of the population in this Greek society would have been slaves. So anybody who had a good education or a good family lineage or was wealthy just never worked, ever. Work was viewed as evil. People who weren't even people, slaves, who were viewed as objects, they did all of your grunt work. And so work was viewed as innately bad, as beneath you if you were enlightened or if you were wealthy or if, if you were just morally good enough to avoid that, and you just threw all of that stuff on the slaves, and they allowed all of that to go through them. And so perhaps Paul was dealing with this, or perhaps they were just lazy church members who, who didn't want to work. But either way, there's a lot of stuff going on in this culture, and it reminded me that a lot of that stuff kind of still plays itself out here, even in Kootenai County in modern day time. Oftentimes, uh, as church uh, employees were uh, viewed differently. 
and I was on Facebook this week, and uh, there was this uh, post about the, uh, something that happened in the church, and all these people are just ragging on pastors. That pastors are just too weak to make it in the real world, and so they've got to hide in churches, and we just do our jobs here because we can't do any real work. And it was really interesting that they used the term real work. And so often people, particularly even believers, divide things, right? Like there's this false dichotomy between God's work and then the rest of work, which God really isn't too pleased about, but it's a necessary evil. And man, that's so false. It's interesting how so often people are like, man, I wish I could be a pastor instead of doing my stupid job. And there, there's such belittling attitudes towards work. It's interesting, and it's, it's so false according to what the Scripture has to teach us. It's, um, it's fascinating. And so what Paul says here at the end is he breaks it into two kind of extremes. People are either not working at all, but some have turned into busybodies. They're so busy, they're so frenetic, and yet they're not accomplishing anything of use. Nothing worthwhile is being uh, the product of their busyness. Those are kind of the two extremes. And it was interesting to do some research this, um, this week about the generations. And one of the cool things about Anthem, one of our strengths is we're multi-generational. It's awesome to see like kids running around and to see people walking in with walkers, right? Like we've got from two to 92 here at church and there's such strength in the diversity of our ages. And it's kind of interesting how these two poles of viewing work as evil or uh, just loving it so much that we turn into busybodies, how that plays out in our generations. And uh, after World War II, you boomers, you baby boomers, kind of took the nation over, right? You were the largest generation, the largest working force America had ever seen, and you guys worked, and you worked hard, and you were faithful workers. According to Fortune magazine, over 41% of baby boomers stayed with their employer for at least 20 years. You guys were long-term. You understood what it meant to be steadfast and to have endurance, and you guys set the bar pretty high. Unfortunately, and often, unfortunately, is that boomers uh, became busybodies. They loved their work so much that they forgot what was ultimate, and work became ultimate. Men particularly found their identity in their work, their value in their work. And oftentimes, we'll still see it played out. When men lose their jobs or retire, they lose themselves. What do I do? Who am I? What, what makes me worthwhile? What, what makes me distinct from other people? Because all of that was so wrapped up in their occupation that they became busybodies and they lost the fact that life is more than what you do for a vocation. And that's pretty interesting. And on the extreme of that is my lazy generation, us millennials. Boomers, we have usurped you. We are now the largest working generation in America. Lord help us. We do not like work, generally speaking. Uh, we view it as a necessary evil. So often we hear comments uh, about things. I was just reading a comment from a millennial this week that said, when life seems overwhelming and you hate your job, just remember you're going to die. Like, oh, that's so cool. And we just view work as a necessary evil. You just have to be miserable for eight hours so that you can fund and fuel the rest of your life. Oh, I've got to go work and just waste most of my day so then I can go do God's stuff or go do whatever floats my boat after work. And we just write off a huge segment of our lives. And um, Forbes magazine did a study on baby boomers and found that while millennials are like, or while boomers are long-term people, millennials, 91% of us will stay at a job for three years max. We're going to have like 15, 20, 25 occupations through our working lifespan. And what, what does that show about raising the bar for work? Well, nothing. So it's interesting to recognize that there's such a healthy middle ground here. Like, we ought not be busybodies. Worshiping your work is horrible. That's an idol. That's false worship. And over here, hating your work and writing it off, that's just as foolish. But somewhere in the middle lies the truth. Like, how can we balance our occupation well? How can we think about work in God-glorifying ways? And the cool thing is that Scripture has a lot to say about that, particularly today has a lot to say about that. And so I get excited because oftentimes as a preacher, like, we're preaching about wonderful things. But at the end of the message, it's like, well, how does this really apply to people's lives? And for, so for this one, it's exciting. Like, this, is, this has got tremendous application. Like, I hope your minds just start spinning and your imagination goes wild with how to apply this to your life today. How can you glorify God with your work? As Paul is commanding that we must work and we must abstain from those who do not work. Whatever the motivation for these people were uh, to not work, Paul addresses them in verse 12. 
Now, to those who are such, whatever your motivating factors doesn't really matter. We command you, we exhort you through the Lord Jesus Christ that you work in quietness and that you eat your own bread. Like, mind your own business and work hard. Don't, don't be a busybody, but, but work and invest into it and plant your roots down. And, and for the glory of God, like, be a good worker. Going on. But, oh, no, I'll stop. Uh, yeah, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And I think that's so cool that there's this interconnectedness again. Paul's saying, like, for you who are doing well, like, don't, don't become demoralized because other people are misbehaving. Like, do not grow weary in doing good. You're doing excellent. Keep it up. Like, don't look to the people who are misbehaving to set the bar for what your opinions or what your performance should be like. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus Christ. On the flip side of that, for those of us in church, uh, either if we're not working or just to apply it more liberally, if we're just continually misbehaving and not changing our actions, even though we know we're doing wrong, you have the opportunity to demoralize and to cause destruction to the church because you're flagrantly disobeying the rules and you're getting away with it and you're causing much destruction within God's body and how dare you do that? That is not a light thing to carry around flippantly. And so for Paul to encourage them again is saying, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. If any one of you does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Wow, those are some strong words again. That's, that's fascinating. That Paul is saying, like, not just avoid them, like, withdraw completely from them. That he may be ashamed, that she might be ashamed. It's not us shaming people. It's us withdrawing ourselves. We're quitting this enablement so that the person can recognize the shame in their own activity. And there's a big difference between those two. You don't heap shame on believers. You withdraw from them and allow them to recognize the shame in their own poor behavior. And there is a huge difference, church, in those two. And let us make sure we do one and not the other. So there's shame in not working. Specifically, Paul is saying there's shame in disobeying this. There's shame in not working. There's shame in freeloading on the church. And it reminds me of the opposite of shame is, is probably glory, Right? And if we think of glory and perfection, it takes us back to Genesis. We get such a small snippet of perfection before sin undermines everything. But in Genesis 1 and 2, and your homework this week is to read those, and to be on the lookout for what God asked of man and woman. The cool thing is, is that we don't notice man and woman, Adam and Eve, just lounging around, doing nothing, and that's what perfection is. Even before sin entered, God had put man and woman to work. God expected them to work and to tend the garden and to look out for it, and they had dominion over it. They were basically stewards of God's earth, right? And for God's, for God's glory, they worked, and they worked hard. And I think that's the glory of work, that in perfection, God expects you to work and to work hard and to be diligent and to be passionate about it and to do it as if you were doing it unto the Lord. How many of you guys have heard that? Do it as if you've done it unto the Lord. And I heard that as a kid, and I was cleaning a toilet, and I was thinking, well, Jesus wouldn't really look at a toilet super, like, why would Jesus care how much this toilet is clean? He would just use the toilet, right? And it was probably a poor teaching instance for that person to have used that verse. Uh, but that harkens back uh, from an epistle that Paul wrote to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6, Paul is talking about work and working hard, and he, he, t he totally calls out slaves. These people who were not viewed as people, they had absolutely no human rights. They had to do whatever they commanded. Their rulers were more often than not tyrannical and abusive. And yet to these people, in the context of work, here's what Paul had to say. Bond servants, slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and with trembling, in sincerity of heart, and work as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Jesus, doing the will from the heart, I'm sorry, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as unto the Lord, not unto men. That's so cool. That's where this idea comes from, that no matter how bad your job is, even if you were a slave commanded to do the most disgusting things imaginable as far as work is concerned, you can glorify God through the attitude of your heart. And so whatever the worst job you've had or currently have is, I can promise you it's not as bad as a Roman slave. I can promise you that. And yet even a Roman slave can be encouraged, whatever you do, 
Recognize ultimately you're working for God, that work is a God-glorifying activity, that the time you are working is a wide open door of time of worship and of, of ministry to occur as you engage people with your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. And so when we view this thing of work as God glorifying, as a commandment, as an imperative for the believer, it opens up this wide door, particularly for us young lazy people, to recognize God has given you a tremendous gift that you have to work. And that those of us that have work, it's such an incredibly fertile place for God to be glorified. That despite the sucky circumstances, despite tyrannical uh, administrators over me, I can ultimately recognize that God is above it all, that I'm ultimately working for Jesus Christ. And whatever my task, that I can do it as if unto the Lord. And how cool is that? That eight hours a day, I have the opportunity to worship Jesus. Whether I'm laying tile or I'm a stay-at-home parent or I'm preaching, no matter what your activity is, the condition of your heart can bring as much glory to God cleaning a toilet as it can standing in front of a group on Sunday morning, as much as it can laying tile, as much as it can raking leaves. Whatever you do can be ultimately God-glorifying, as God-glorifying as any other occupation or vocation here on earth. And that's amazing, church. What an incredible opportunity we have. And the more we explore it, we recognize that that frees us up. That, that, that basically locks us in a work environment with people who know Jesus. Instead of work sucking because we work with a bunch of no good sinners, suddenly we are being placed as missionaries into a foreign field and those people are stuck with us. They can't leave us. And we get to exhibit the gospel of Jesus Christ through our actions and we get to share with them and pray with them. What an incredible opportunity, church. And then the more we explore, the more we realize the resources that come from working allow us to support ourselves, and that is a noble calling. More than just support ourselves and subsistence living, here in America we have, we have excess, right? That excess isn't to fuel your selfish pursuits. That excess is to be generous with those in need. That excess, or the first part of that, is to support the church so that you get to run the church. Isn't that cool? Like, we don't, we don't just own a bunch of stuff and sell it. Like, your benevolence, your obedience to God to be generous fuels the church. And this church is doing incredible things, Anthem. And so how cool is it that God gives you the opportunity to work so that you can fuel the ministry of Anthem? What an incredible opportunity God has given us through work. But if anyone doesn't do this, note them Do not keep company with them that they may be ashamed. Verse 15, again, here's the motivation. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. This is spiritual quarantine, right? We don't want to heap shame. This isn't punitive. This is ultimately restorative. Like, you've been warned. Let's let's review the process here. Paul planted a church. Paul set an incredible example with his hard work. Paul taught them the truth about work. Paul sent Timothy, as we can read in 1 Thessalonians, to straighten them out. Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians. Time has passed in between 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Paul sends someone else with a new epistle. Paul has done an incredibly good job of being thorough and patient with these people. After six steps, if they continue in unrepentant sin, there are very natural consequences for their good and for the good of the church. And so Paul is showing we don't just flippantly react out of anger towards people. We, through love, endure with them and go through process with them. And ultimately, then when that has gone through, then we might need to take steps of discipline. But in doing so, always remember Matthew 7, right? Let's focus on ourselves first. Let's take that, that plank out of our own eye first. And I tell you what, if all of us just fo- worked on a plank in our own eye, there would be no speck in our brother's eye to have to go to because we'd all take care of our own junk through the power of Jesus Christ. And so first and foremost, let's remove the plank. Secondly, remember this is love and relationship. We don't want a bunch of witch hunters in Anthem trying to figure out who's slacking off so that we cannot be friends with them. How exciting is that activity? But what we're dealing with here is love and relationship. When you have the integrity of relationship to lovingly call someone out, you should do so. If you have no relationship and you need to introduce yourself to someone before you yell at them, as just happened to me at the end of last service, that's probably an incorrect opportunity to to tell someone about what they're doing wrong or what you feel like they're doing wrong. So don't count them as an enemy, but admonish them as a brother. And so Paul closes with this benediction. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you this peace always in every way. May the Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand which is a sign of every epistle, so I write. 
Again and again, Paul's like padding this with authenticity. This isn't a fake letter. This isn't like this false person pretending to be Paul, writing you false doctrine. This is me. You can trust this. I'm writing this as I always do. It's my epistle, so I write. And he closes with this final thought. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, as we digest your word, I pray um, that you would give us um, a divine, supernatural imagination of how to apply this to our lives. Lord, I pray that we would be slow to apply it to other persons and that we would be quick to apply it to our own heart. Lord, we thank you so much for your church that we get to be a part of it is just so overwhelming and humbling. God, I pray that this church would flourish, not because of us, Lord, but because of you. You are so good. Your gospel is so life-giving. We pray that many, many others would come to know you, Lord God, and we pray that that would occur through our obedience, through our endurance, through our diligence, Lord God. How cool that we get to participate that even within the context of work. Pray that we would find out what it truly means, Lord God, to do our job as if we were doing it unto you. I pray that we would recognize that our, our employment is a gift. God, I pray that we'd recognize that our resources are ultimately yours. God, I pray that you would free us up to be the most generous church so that this world may know that we're living for something else than a fat paycheck and nice toys. And this is only possible through you, Lord God. And so as Paul prayed for the Thessalonians, man, God, help us protect us, guard us, allow this to flourish, Lord God, through your goodness, through your perfection, through your agape love, Lord God, through your patient endurance. We pray this in your name. Amen. Would you guys